Alex Woodworth was described by those who knew him as an extremely caring, empathetic, and intelligent individual, the type of person who could spend all day pondering on complex ideas, philosophical questions, and who genuinely cared about someone's answer when he asked how their day was going. Multiple people who claimed to be loose acquaintances of his would state that on several occasions, Alex had spent hours with them after they cited they were struggling mentally, talking to them about their mental health crisis and making sure they left the conversation feeling safer in their headspace. Alex seemed to perceive people on a different level than most people his age, and was widely viewed as a kind-hearted, deeply compassionate person. According to Alex's close friends, he always seemed attracted to the people in society who needed help. He seemed to find value in helping those around him get better in whatever way that manifested. He had his own struggles, and would become a non-judgmental sounding board for people in his life. If they were frustrated with their own relationship, if they had felt unheard or abandoned, he would be there with a coffee and a listening ear. Some professionals who have looked at this case have theorized that this was a manifestation of Alex's own insecurities, and that he felt that this was the only way he could add value into other people's lives. Alex was the oldest of four, and was a deeply involved big brother. He enjoyed taking care of his siblings, and doing everything he could to make sure that they were okay. If his siblings needed anything from him, he was always right there, ready to aid them with whatever they needed. He had a Bachelor of Science from the University of Wisconsin, with a major in philosophy and a minor in biology. When he was 23 years old, he had just begun to apply to graduate schools to get his PhD in philosophy, where his ultimate dream was to become a philosophy professor. He wanted to engage with people, to ask them deep questions that would change the course of their lives, and provide them with knowledge that would inevitably make them more discerning individuals. Those who knew him were well aware of his love of philosophy, as it was nearly all he would talk about. If he had a moment to himself while at work, he'd be reading a new book on the subject, jotting down his own thoughts in his journal that he always carried on his person. When he was on break, he'd be scrolling through Amazon, looking up new literature on the subject, trying to gain every bit of knowledge that he could. If you engaged with him, even a little bit, undoubtedly the subject would come up, and he would attempt to get the other party interested in his musings. Most of the time, he was unsuccessful, but people often allowed him to ramble on. Alex's life was in a transitional period of time in late summer of 2017. He was working at a coffee shop in Wisconsin, while also working part-time as a substitute teacher, applying to go back to school, and beginning to think about what he wanted to do with his life. And then he met Ezra. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we will be revisiting the case of Ezra McCandless, this time focusing solely on the murder of Alex Woodworth. This video is the second portion of our coverage on Ezra. We'll be briefly going over the story so far, but I do recommend you watch our first video before this. This video would also not be possible without the help of Rottweiler Investigations, which is one of the best channels for uploading high-quality trial and interrogation footage. I'll be leaving a link to their channel in the description box down below, along with their PayPal and Cash App links. I cannot recommend their channel enough. If you like our content, you will probably love theirs. Before we properly begin this video, we need to summarize the story that came before it. If you've already watched our first video, a timestamp will be left below to skip this review of the case details. Ezra McCandless was a 20-year-old woman who lived in a state of flux. She was an incredibly smart, outgoing, and enterprising person, and those who were close to her would comment that she would turn herself into whatever she needed to be for someone, as if she had the ability to change on a dime. To some, she was a shot of adrenaline, pushing them to do things they had never done before and making them feel alive for the first time in years. To others, she was a deep thinker, who enjoyed the quiet pleasures of life. And to others still, she was an attention-hungry liar who didn't care who she hurt to get what she wanted. When Ezra was 20, she wanted to be known as a free-spirited, struggling artist. Though her parents offered her free housing and asked very little of her, she would portray them to her friends as being harsh, vindictive people, who put way too much pressure on her. To escape their oppressive control, Ezra would spend the majority of her days at Racy's, a coffee shop in Eau Claire that catered to all walks of life. She would talk about the coffee shop wistfully, stating that it was a melting pot in the city, and that people go there to engage with other people, unlike chain shops like Starbucks. She was well known by the majority of people who frequented Racy's, as she would spend all day there and talk to whoever entered the door. And it was there that she met her boyfriend of eight months, Jason Mangle. Jason was 13 years her senior, a piece of information she kept from him when they initially began dating in the summer of 2017. He worked as a medic in the National Guard, a job that would take him away from Wisconsin for weeks at a time. 
But from the moment the pair met, they claimed to only have eyes for each other. At the time, Ezra didn't have a working cell phone, so they kept in contact via Instagram, and she informed Jason that her life was anything but perfect. She indicated to him that she was struggling at home with parents she described as controlling. Her mother was always on her case about getting a job and moving out, and her father was constantly telling her that it was unsafe to drive her car without insurance. She described feeling claustrophobic in the shared home, and opined about her lack of finances to the older man stating that though she had tried job hunting, there was no way she could afford to live on her own if she found employment. She purposely made it seem as if any attempt to improve her life was hopeless to her romantic partner, implying that he was the only one who could truly help her. Mere weeks after the pair had met and begun dating, Jason would ask Ezra to move in with him and his roommate, with them agreeing that she wouldn't have to worry about paying for anything until she had a job. Ezra was seemingly over the moon with this turn of events, and the pair became even more inseparable than they had before. Jason would describe Ezra as being energizing, pushing him to do things he had never thought he would. Nearly every day with her was an adventure, but there were some drawbacks as well. After Ezra had moved into the shared apartment, she had begun to display some troubling behavior. She became controlling over Jason, not wanting him to spend time with anyone outside of herself although she wanted to spend time with others on her own. She would routinely tell him that she didn't approve of some of his friends, and if they were trying to hang out with them, she would accuse him of talking negatively about her, which she claimed was emotionally abusive. She would state that he shouldn't want to hang out with other people without her, and the fact that he was comfortable being away from her was a sign that he didn't truly love her, and if that didn't work, she would tell him if he left, she would hurt herself. These arguments would usually end with Jason apologizing to his significant other, for trying to see his friends. Soon, he was isolated and only speaking with people that Ezra approved of. But that was far from the only issue between the couple. Jason would have a hard time dealing with how outgoing and flirty his partner was, especially with other men. On a number of occasions, Jason would bring up to Ezra that she was extremely physical with other men, and that it made him feel jealous. She was far from understanding about this. She would accuse Jason of trying to control her and being sexist towards her. She would argue that she engaged with men and women the same way, and that his assertions that her relationships with her male friends are anything but platonic are his own issues that he is projecting onto her. The end of these discussions would usually see Jason apologizing to Ezra and promising to do better, but unsurprisingly, Ezra was in fact cheating on Jason with multiple people, namely two people that Jason felt close to. The first person was his best friend, John Hansen. John and Ezra had begun sleeping together when Jason was away on military assignment for two weeks. Jason had asked his friend to check in on Ezra while he was away, just to make sure she was okay. And in that time, the pair had begun a BDSM relationship and had sex on Jason's bed. Jason found out about this affair after seeing text messages between the two, in which Ezra sent John the following. Are you going to pound this anytime soon? Just let me know when I get my next in and out Winky face. Also, hanging and doing art agon would be nice because you are more than a good dick. When Jason discovered these text messages, he felt as if he was losing his mind. The two people closest to him had lied to him for weeks, and he didn't know what to believe. How long had they been lying? How much of what they told him was even true? And how had they been able to so easily conceal such a monumental betrayal? He immediately confronted his girlfriend, and she denied any wrongdoing. When she realized that he had indisputable evidence that they had had sex with another person, she claimed that it wasn't what it looked like. John had sexually assaulted her. John too denied that the pair had had sex initially, only admitting to it after Jason told him he had seen the text. But when he was told that Ezra was claiming that the sex had not been consensual, he adamantly denied that, stating that it was Ezra who had come on to him multiple times and that the texts proved that. Jason, not knowing who to believe, would tell Ezra that if she was telling the truth, she needed to talk to the police, and Ezra, not knowing how to argue against this, would eventually file a police report. In our first video, we reviewed the interview between Ezra and Officer Vang, and reviewed how she lied throughout it. It was honestly one of the most disturbing things we've had to watch for this channel, as she was able to lie so convincingly that if we had not seen direct evidence that proved she was not being honest, we probably would have believed her. The police opened an investigation into Ezra's claims, and were only able to find evidence that the relationship had been consensual between the two, and it had been spurred on by Ezra. The lead investigator asked Ezra for any communication, specifically texts, that were sent between Hansen and herself, and she claimed that she had deleted them. Meanwhile, Hansen readily sent them over. 
they would also speak to one of Ezra's closest friends, and he would acknowledge that Ezra admitted to sleeping with John consensually, but stated she regretted doing it. This person was Alex Woodworth. Alex was 23 when he met Ezra at Racy's. He was working at the coffee shop and knew Ezra tangentially because she spent the majority of her free time there. She had made friends with most of the people who frequented Racy's, engaging with anyone who walked in as if she were the bouncer, so both Jason and her loosely knew of Alex. But it wouldn't be until after her relationship with Jason had begun that she approached the barista on her own, and they became friends. According to Ezra, while she was at the shop with her boyfriend, she saw the 23-year-old sitting at a table while on his break. He was furiously writing into his journal and appeared enthralled with whatever he was working on, which sparked her interest. She detached herself from Jason and approached the barista, and inquired about what he was writing. When he explained the philosophical theory he was working on to her, she quickly expanded on the concepts in a way that interested him, and the two got to talking as if they were already close friends. Alex wasn't used to this kind of response, as most of the people he spoke about this with blew him off, but Ezra was different. She actively listened to him, nodding along as he went over the concepts and reacting as if his thoughts were deeply important to her. She was engaged, so much so that the two spoke for a significant amount of time, so significant that it of course made Jason feel uncomfortable. At some point during the pair's initial conversation, Jason made his way over to his girlfriend and the barista, making Alex aware that Ezra was taken, but the two carried on chatting. Ezra described this disturbance as being somewhat annoying and territorial of Jason, and because Jason couldn't keep up with their philosophical conversation, he retreated. Alex quickly became friends with the couple, joining them on various outings and coming to their shared apartment often, but it was obvious that the real friendship was between Alex and Ezra. Ezra would often come to Racy's on her own, and when Alex would go on break, the two would go on walks together. They both enjoyed waxing poetic about difficult philosophical ideals, with their discussions often turning into intense debates, and Alex found Ezra to be just as compelling as Jason did. Whatever he said, she had an answer for, and they would spend hours going back and forth, debating anything and everything. Initially, Jason was incredibly supportive of the friendship between his girlfriend and Woodworth, and would state that he had pushed them together in a way. He was quoted by CBS News as saying, I kind of pushed them together at one time, because I knew they both had similar viewpoints. He had some things in his life that I figured she could help him with, and I thought that he could help her with things in her life. Like she had with Jason, Ezra would tell Alex about her personal issues, telling him that he was a sort of confidant for her. When Jason's work would take him away for weeks at a time, Ezra would rely on Alex heavily. She would tell the substitute teacher that she felt lonely and dejected, and that she needed someone who could be with her. She would also tell Alex that she found Jason to be uncompelling at times, as if he couldn't mentally keep up with her. She stated she wanted to be challenged intellectually, and didn't really know if she could get that with Jason, but it seemed she could get that with him. Three months into her relationship with Jason, Ezra would become pregnant and get an abortion. Jason would isolate himself immediately from Ezra, choosing to sleep on the couch of their shared apartment. She was struggling with the aftermath of the decision, but was still dedicated to the relationship. In turn, Ezra began to rely on Alex more, and the relationship went from an inappropriately close friendship to an incredibly intimate sexual relationship. Both Ezra and Alex would state that they were dating and engaged in a full relationship, and Alex would tell Ezra she needed a breakup with Jason, but she would refuse, stating that she didn't know what to do. She told Alex that she loved him, that her relationship with Jason had run its course and they didn't even sleep in the same bed anymore. But when Alex told her how the sneaking around made him feel secondary, like she was going to discard him in any moment, she stated he should simply not think about it as much. The following is the journal entry written by Alex about his feelings on the matter. I know that I am not your priority. I am secondary to you. I believe that you love me, but your love for another is what you place your faith in. I am loved, but in a way that you can always give up. You believe that things can get better with the love you prioritize. That means that you believe you will abandon me someday. I am in so much pain because you love me, and still you hope to abandon me to my loneliness again. Can you see that your desire for your priority is also a desire for my annihilation? Can I show you this? Or is my only hope to be that your priority cease to be, so for the development of my own significance? Can you realize that I am your significant other in a way that I benefit from? While Ezra was in a relationship with Jason, Alex was also Jason's close friend, someone he relied on through hard times. During the holidays, Alex would cut his wrists with a knife he was given as a gift, 
and instead of going to the hospital, he called Jason. The National Guard medic patched the wound and spoke to Alex for a considerable amount of time afterwards to make sure he was okay. Jason felt incredibly close to the philosophy buff. All the while, Alex and Ezra were having an affair under his nose. The following is an example of some of the text correspondence between Alex and Ezra to give a general idea of how they would talk to one another. A lot of these texts are out of order because of how they were archived, but I've done my best to make them make sense. Alex, I know what you mean. I am always anxious letting anyone read anything but a highly polished essay. My personal writing is raw. It's a little like being naked, haha. <laughs> Ezra, I know what you mean. I am always anxious letting write? It does feel like exposing it all. Flaws and weird writing quirks out in the open. Alex, one of my favorite phrases is, come as you are, flaws and all. So writing is good for that. I have weird ideas about the matter, but I quite like seeing people as they are, flaws and all. It is more real and more ideal. Ezra, flaws can be pretty interesting but hard to show. Alex, they seem more intimate than our strengths, I think. When we are vulnerable, we seem more true to ourselves than when we are invincible. I love seeing flaws, blemishes, scars, tattoos, etc. on bodies. Mistakes, regrets, marks, and guilts in our memories. They make people, well, people, rather than scary others we have to put up a front to. But I've had too much to drink, and I'm getting flowery. We should exchange notes at some point. Underscored smiley face thing. Ezra, I was a very sleepy Ez and fell asleep on you. I love what you had to say about flaws. I think true strength is showing them fearlessly and, and embracing them. I'm trying myself to let some show. I'd love to read your notes sometime. In a later conversation, the two had started sleeping together. Alex stated, I was a very unhappy person when I lived with my family, with a lot of guilt. Being here brings that back a little. Ezra responded, Just think of happy, sweet things and cute date things. That's what I do when I'm sad. Alex, I'll try. My phone also hates this house. Ezra, you are such a jimmy. Alex, shush. I'm just me, only that. People would be jealous, but I wouldn't even know how much better your booty looks without any clothes. Ezra, OMG, I'm blushing. Nobody knows how nice your cock is. Alex, oh, but you do. I love how much you love my cock inside you. Ezra, I do, let's be honest. Alex, you're simply divine without anything on yourself. Their relationship was incredibly sexual and incredibly intimate, with Alex stating he loved Ezra on multiple occasions and her saying it back. However, she showed no signs of actually wanting to leave Jason. It was only when Jason had found direct evidence of her cheating that their relationship would actually end. Jason found out that Ezra had cheated on him with John and Alex the same night, and Ezra claimed that while Alex didn't technically sexually assault her, he did take advantage of her and manipulate her. She stated that she had opened up to him about what John had done to her, and after she told him she'd been unable to deny John's advances because he made her feel like garbage, he decided to pressure her into sex. Though she didn't outright say it, she implied to Jason that her relationship with Alex, the one he was worried about for months and noticed was uncomfortably close, was actually a case of sexual abuse. Jason confronted both Alex and John at the coffee shop, distraught that the two friends had lied to him. Alex apologized to Jason, but stated that he had real feelings for Ezra. Shortly after this confrontation, Ezra would file her police report against John, and the investigation into the assault would begin. Almost immediately, the police found the messages between Ezra and John, as well as Ezra and Alex. Alex would speak to the police and inform them what Ezra had told him about John, and the investigation would be dropped. At this time, friends of Alex began to worry for him. They knew that he had had a sexual relationship with Ezra, and seeing how quickly she had falsely accused John of wrongdoing made them feel as if she would do the same to him. What they didn't know was that she already had, privately to Jason. In response to their concerns, Alex maintained that he wasn't worried about it, because he had months of text messages that proved that their relationship was consensual. The relationship between Ezra and Jason was still technically intact, but his trust in her had obviously been broken. He attempted to get more distance from the situation, needing to take time to himself to get his bearings without her interference. But she insisted that he needed to spend more time with her, to hear her out, and that she needed him to help her through the immense trauma she had just gone through. Despite the betrayal, she painted herself as the victim in the situation, and that if Jason left her, he would be abandoning her in her darkest hour. She would text him constantly, asking him if she could see him, and attempting to run into him organically. 
she bought multiple journals and filled them with passages about how theirs was an ancient love that could overcome all things, and she would try to deliver these writings to him by hand. Jason would reject the journals, asking her once more to give him space so he could figure out what he wanted, but she wouldn't. She would send him letters and emails, waxing poetic about how betraying him had broken her to the core, how she had been so foolish to be manipulated by both John and Alex. She wrote about how both men had preyed on her weakness, and not so subtly implied that her own actions in this situation were not her fault. Jason had left her on her own, after all, and he knew she was fragile. Jason would tell CBS News, quote, She wove these tales about these manipulative, vindictive men who tried to take me away from you, Jason. It's not me, it's them. I spent eight months constantly being toyed with. It was like, I can't trust you anymore. You think they're little white lies, but they build up, and they build up and build up. And before you know it, there's horrifying things happening. Her writing during this time clearly laid out how she hoped Jason would conceptualize what happened. He would view Ezra as the victim of the two men who wanted to use her for sex, and overlook how deeply inappropriate her actions had been. She wanted him to ignore the fact that he had asked her directly about Alex for months, and how she had manipulated him into believing that he had been seeing things that weren't there. She wanted to wash her hands of any fault in this situation, despite the fact that the fault had been entirely hers. While this was happening, she was still seeing Alex. It wouldn't be until February 24th, 2018 that the pair technically broke up. Ezra texted Woodworth to tell him she no longer wanted to speak to him, and to not look at her when she went into Racy's for coffee, but she was still going to go there, even though there were plenty of other coffee shops in the area. Alex was hurt, but he understood, and didn't try to contact Ezra again. She told Jason that she had finally ended things with Alex, and went further to claim that the story about the affair had spread to all of their friends, and had led to her being publicly slut-shamed, with someone writing her phone number on the bathroom wall of Racy's. Well, we don't know who did this, given her constant attempts to victimize herself in order to manipulate the people in her life, it's likely that she did this herself in an attempt to win favor with Jason, and to look like a victim and get him to talk to her. And it worked. At some point, Jason went back to Racy's and covered up the phone number, choosing to write a statement on top of it that he and Ezra had said to each other often. He had relented to Ezra's incessant messages, and they had begun talking again, although he maintained he didn't know if he wanted to be in a relationship with her anymore. She continued to message him, telling him that over the last month, she had journaled about the demise of their relationship and felt more than ever that she had been taken advantage of by both men. Ezra went further to say that John and Alex had seen how sad she was when he was away, how fragile she was, and had used that against her. She implored him to search his heart, to see if he really believed that she was the kind of person who would do this to him, because if that was the case, they shouldn't be together. On March 21st, 2018, Ezra and Jason exchanged 600 messages. The first few messages in their conversation were Ezra encouraging Jason to work through his negative feelings against her. She was coaching him on how to get the thoughts of her cheating on him out of his head, and how he needed to look towards the positives in their relationship instead of focusing on the negative. When he said he couldn't trust that there were any positives, as he wasn't sure she had been faithful to him their entire relationship, she told him that it would get easier with time, and that he just needed to trust her. She then told Jason that she wanted to see Alex one last time, just to get some closure. This obviously greatly upset the 33-year-old. He asked her what exactly she felt like she needed to say to the man she had cheated on him with. What about their relationship, which she said was predicated on manipulation and abuse, felt unfinished. To which Ezra stated she wanted to have the last word, to tell him off properly. Ezra implored Jason to understand. It wasn't like she was attracted to Alex or even had been emotionally connected to him. She just wanted to, quote, take her power back. However, this assertion that she had to see Alex had the opposite effect than she intended on Jason. That night, the medic had seen a mutual friend of theirs who had informed them of Ezra's relationship with Alex, and they said the relationship was deep and significant. Definitely not the one-sided, manipulative affair that Ezra had painted it out to be. This friend reminded Jason about how Ezra and Alex had been extremely close, to the point of stating that they were the other's best friend, and that Ezra's statements about Alex being manipulative and preying on her didn't account for how she actively chose to lie about their relationship. This reminder shifted something in Jason, and he began to shut himself off from Ezra once more. And fearing that Jason was really done with her, Ezra began to spiral.
On March 22, 2018, Ezra was acting strange. She never left the house without making sure she was perfectly together, but she hadn't put on any makeup and her clothes were disheveled. Those who knew her would state that appearances meant a lot to Ezra, and to go outside without any makeup was not like her. She drove into Eau Claire in the morning, stopping into Racy's to get a coffee. There, she ran into Jason, who was shocked to see her. She told Jason that in their month apart, she had turned over a new leaf, and she was planning to move out of her father's house and come back to the small town. Jason would state that she was acting strangely during this conversation, and that there was a fire in her eyes. And for the first time since he had known her, she paid for her own coffee. And do you recall working at Racy's on March 22nd, 2018? I do. And on that day, did you see the defendant come to Racy's Coffee Shop? I did. Can you describe for me um, what the defendant did when she came into Racy's, what you observed her do? Um, she came up and she ordered a mocha from me. Um, she paid me, tipped me, and then she talked to people that were seated at the counter. And um, was that a little bit unusual? Yeah. And why was that unusual? She rarely paid and she never tipped. And can you describe for me the defendant's appearance that day? Um, she wasn't wearing makeup. She looked pretty solemn. Can you continue? Um, she was wearing pretty plain clothes. So fair to say she looked different than you remembered her usually looking? Yes. Did you notice anything about the defendant's demeanor during your contact with her that morning? She seemed, um, in my opinion, understandably sad or maybe uh, low. So you were going back and forth between the dry cleaner and Racy's. Did the defendant eventually show up at Racy's? Yeah, I thought it was off because she wasn't supposed to be driving. And let me just, uh, what time approximately was that, if you recall? I honestly don't recall. Morning time? It was morning. Um, do you remember where you were when you first saw the defendant? I was sitting on the bench, uh, I believe with Maxwell and a few of the other regulars. The bench outside? The bench outside races, yes. Did you have, without getting into the content, any conversation with the defendant? <laughs> Very brief. We might have passed a couple idle words, but not much. It was I was more confused than I was, like. Did the defendant uh, and you eventually go into races? Maybe not together, but not together. I mean, did you notice anything about the defendant's demeanor that caused you concern? She was a little fired up. When Ezra left the coffee shop, Jason couldn't help but feel like something was deeply wrong. Knowing that she had said she wanted to see Alex to tell him off the night before, a person she claimed assaulted her, he felt like he was obligated to make sure she was alright. Jason hoped that she hadn't actually gone to see Alex, and decided that he would ride his bike past the barista's house just to check. If she was there, he would hang around to make sure she wasn't taken advantage of, but if she wasn't, he would forget the entire ordeal. He rode to Alex's house and quickly spotted Ezra's 2003 Chevy Impala. The car was still running, music was still playing, and the driver's side door was wide open. Jason didn't know what to do. His mind was racing and he began to pace outside the house for nearly 45 minutes. He hoped that in that time, Ezra would come out, but the longer she stayed inside, the more sure he was that she was being hurt by Alex. Eventually, he resolved to go inside and see what was happening. He entered the home and found Ezra and Alex talking intently. When the former lovers spotted Jason, he claimed that they seemed emotionless and they no longer looked like themselves. In hindsight, he would state that it was obvious that they were talking intimately, like they had throughout his relationship with Ezra, but his intrusion forced them to stop. The medic told the pair if they wanted to keep talking, they should talk in a public area. That way no one can be taken advantage of. They agreed, but right as all three of them began to leave the home, police pulled up. A concerned neighbor had seen Jason pacing outside of the home earlier, and thinking that he was up to no good, called the police. The following is the dash cam footage of that interaction, as provided by Rottweiler Investigations. And said they saw you park your bike over here, yeah. and then walk over there, look yeah. around in that car. Do you know that person that lives it's there? My, it's my girlfriend's car, or okay. my ex-girlfriend. We're kind of in a situation, and when she talked to me this morning, I was because the guy 
guy that lives there is involved in an assault case that she's with. Or, or I mean, she's the victim of? She's the victim of an assault that happened. And when she went to him for consolement, I was gone on military orders. Okay. She went to him to talk to him about stuff, and then he kind of took advantage of her, too, and she wanted to talk to him, I think, today about some stuff. And I was paranoid because she had, like, fire in her eyes. Okay. So I... Who's, your, who's the girlfriend? Ezra McCandless. Okay. I was just worried because, like... Was the door standing open over there when you got there on I the knocked, car? I knocked, like, three times. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear a scuffle or okay. anything. So knocked, knocked, yelled opened the door and I heard her say let him help you let him help you so then I said hey is everything okay is everyone all right right now I mean I'm a medic in the military so like I was paranoid I was paranoid that someone was going to do something irrational and okay and they're in the house on the corner here or yeah which... they're on the, I think they're fine though I mean I don't okay. know I'm, I'm just I just saw of... the door to the car was standing open too was yeah I wanted to turn her car off her car was running so that's why I was like worried because it was running and I was like okay uh, what's going on? Like, what's going on? Is everything okay? Okay. Do you have any ID with you? Yeah. One away headquarters is 10 2. Sorry. Ten four. Jason, you live in town? Roger that. I don't think he's dangerous, but I don't know. Do you know what his name is? Alex Alex Woodsworth. Okay. Or Woodsworth. Yeah, I think it's Woodsworth or Woodsworth. Uh, three eight eight six eighty four. Roger that. You mind if I grab my bike quick? Uh, just give me your address here and a phone number, and then we'll let you head out for now. Oh, I'm not gonna head out. I'm, I'm just. Going. You can head over there. Okay. I'll go and check on them. What's your address? Uh, 135 Broadway Street, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And a phone number? 715-225-0220. Okay. You can go over by your bike. Hi. Is everything okay here? Yeah. Okay. Somebody called us kind of worried because they saw Jason come over here and yeah. he was going in the car and they weren't sure what was going on. No. No. Everything's fine. Everything's Just, fine? Yeah. Okay. Do you guys have any idea with you? Just yeah. yeah. I got to write a report here that I came over and talked with you guys. Of course. Um, they were just a little worried because they saw the car running over here and they weren't sure what was going on yeah. and all that jazz. You want to just slide it out of there? I don't want to take your wallet from you. I have this and I'll find my license. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. It's in here somewhere. I just always have trouble finding it. That's not it. Does that work for an ID? Yep, that's fine. Okay, I'm sorry. My license is somewhere in here. That's okay. You know, I just usually have it. Uh, one one on ninety four. That's an easy birthday to remember, huh? It really is. <laughs> Alex, what's your phone number? Uh, seven one five. Uh huh. Two two zero seventy six eighty five. Okay, and you live here. What's the address, sir? Uh, Five Eleven Cameron Street. Sorry for all this, like. It's okay. Emotion. It's okay. I'd I rather come here and check, and it be yeah. nothing than have something bad happen. Uh, Ezra, where do you live? I live three six seven nine four twenty fifth Avenue. Is that Stanley? Chippewa? That's Stanley, Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. 
And a birth date, Ezra? October 6, 1997. And a phone number for you? Um, currently, that, it would be a house phone, if that's okay. Yep. 715-644-5100. Okay. There you Thank go. You. you guys are good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We're good to go. Everything's good. They're okay. Yeah. Everything's fine. I'll take care of it, too. Okay. No problem. All right. Yeah, have a good day. After the officer spoke to everyone and confirmed that everything was above board, Ezra drove away from the home with Alex sitting in the passenger seat of her car. This would be the last time anyone outside of Ezra ever saw him. A little over three hours later, a call was placed to emergency services. Second. I'm calling 911. What's the address of the emergency? This is Don Sippel calling, and I have a, a young lady that just came to my house, and somebody attacked her, and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn, and... and what is the address you're located at? What? What is the address you are at? E7614, 430th Avenue. Okay. And is she injured? Yeah, she's injured. Her, her mouth is kind of... Uh, got some blood around it, and her clothes are all torn. Okay, and she's by herself? She's by herself. She walked to my house here just recently. Okay, and can you ask her what her name is? Just hold on a second. Okay. What's your name, ma'am? What? You don't know? She's in kind of bad shape. She just says she don't know. Okay, let me put you on hold. Do not hang up. I'm going to start some help, okay? Sure. 16, 18, 20 seconds. All right, Don, you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, what is your middle initial? My middle, middle initial? Yep. A. Okay, and your date of birth? 11, 29, 28. Okay. But it's a young lady that's here that needs help. Yep. yep, I have an ambulance and some officers started that way. Did she say who did this to her? Did she what? Did she say who did this to her? No, she said she was attacked and assaulted and, and she's from Eau Claire. Okay. And uh, yeah, did she... Tell me your name. Did she say where this happened? No, I didn't, I didn't dis discuss that. Okay. Do you want to stay on the phone with me, Don, or...? Sure. Okay. I can, so the ambulance is on the way? Yep, ambulance and officers are on their way. I'll stay on the phone with you as long as I can. Okay, I'll, I'll hang on. Okay. Sixteen, nineteen, twenty-five seconds. Coming for help. They're coming for help. So besides her bleeding from the mouth, do we know... What other injuries she has? Does she look like she's injured anywhere else? Yeah, she looks a little bit. There's some other uh, bloody marks on her, her leg a little bit. Okay. And her pants are all torn. Okay. And how old, if you had to guess, how old do you think she is? How old are you, ma'am? 19. 19, okay. The ambulance is coming. You're going to get help. And so she came on foot, correct? Yes. Okay. Yep, she just walked to my door. Okay. Can you ask her who did this to her? Or are you not repeat, that, repeat that, please. Can you ask her who did this to her? Oh, just a second. Do you have any idea who did this to you? type of blanket or something that you could get her to wrap her up? Sure, I can. Okay. Just hold on. I'm going to lay the phone down here a second. Okay.
16, 21, 11, second. Sixteen twenty-one fifty-nine seconds. Sixteen twenty-two thirty-five seconds. Sir, yep. You don't have any shoes on. Okay. Hands are all muddied. Okay. I think she's probably walked quite a ways. I don't know without shoes how far she came, but right. Okay. And is she outside of your residence, or where is she? No, she's in. I got her inside. She's inside, okay. Yep. She's shivering, you know, she's cold, so I'm, you had a good idea that I, I should have thought of getting a blanket around her to keep her warm, but I got her sitting on a chair. Okay, sounds good. I'll keep you on the phone here. This isn't Keith. Nope, this isn't. Or is he working there yet? Can you send me? Uh, he was in the jail, I know, at one point. Oh, he was at that end of it. Yep. Yeah. Good morning, Mark. This is a strange situation, one I've never seen, and I've been around a long time. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing you called. It's glad she made it somewhere safe anyway. Well, when, when I got, got her and brought her into the house, she wanted me to drive her to, to, to the hospital, but I didn't think I should be doing that. Yeah, no, that's perfectly fine. We'll we'll get her the help she needs. We have an ambulance in her house also. Uh, that's just what she needs. And yep. We'll, we'll get her taken care of. Yep. I suppose the ambulance will probably take 10, 15 minutes to get here. Yeah, they're coming from Menominee, unfortunately, so it'll be a few minutes, but... Well, I'm, I'm just about nine nine miles from... Well, which uh, which station are they coming from? Uh, from Menominee, they'll come from the downtown station. The downtown station? Yeah, it's, it's about 10 miles from there. Sure. She's got glasses on. She said maybe I told her she's 19. Okay, yep. Yeah. And is that, did you say the blood around her mouth looks like it was dry or? Yeah, it's a little on the dry side, yeah. Okay. So it must have happened a little while ago. Okay. I think she's walked quite a ways, maybe. Yeah. I don't know how she found it here, but that's okay. Yep. Yeah. Don, do you have any uh, family pets? They're, right they're, they're here right now with the, the police officer. Okay. All right. I'll let you go. You speak with him, Don. Thank you. You bet. At 4.15 p.m., 88-year-old Don Sipple found Ezra McCandless standing on his front porch. The young woman was covered in mud and blood and appeared to have survived a horrific ordeal. She begged him to let her come inside and use his phone to call emergency services, stating she had just been attacked. Don called 911 and tried to take care of the girl as best he could, but he was unsure how to start. She was so thoroughly covered in blood that it was difficult to assess if it was her own and if she was actively bleeding, or if it belonged to someone else. He felt certain that whatever happened, she had survived an entire ordeal. When paramedics arrived on the scene, Ezra claimed she had no idea what had happened, that everything had been a blur, but she asked them to call Jason repeatedly. The doctors treating her noted that she had the word boy cut into her arm, but most of the injuries were superficial at most. She had some cuts, scratches, and bruises, but nothing that seemed like she had been brutalized. Moreover, they noted that based on the angle of the cuts, they had been self-inflicted, including the word boy. While being treated, Ezra would claim that she had no idea what had happened and all she could remember was being afraid of Alex. When pressed on any details, she would immediately retreat, stating that any time she tried to think about what she had just went through, her mind would go blank. But when asked about the cuts in her arm, she stated that it was Alex who did it. The only issue was the police had no idea where Alex was and where the incident had taken place. The next day, she would be talked to by Detective Proc, who had been the lead investigator in her sexual assault claim. He was familiar with both Ezra and Alex and was asked to work on the case 
because he had already built a rapport with both of them. When he had been handling Ezra's case against John Hansen, Ezra admitted that while she was with Jason Mangle and believed him to be her soulmate, she had also been carrying out an affair with Alex. Proc asked her about the relationship, and Ezra confirmed that it was consensual, but all that would change when he interviewed her on March 23rd. Hi, how are you? Good. You're making friends? Hi, Ezra. Okay. Okay. Alright, here she is. Hi, Ezra. How are you doing? I'm tired. Tired, yeah? When we get done, how should I get this door unlocked from the inside? Yep. Should she just stay here and uh, I can get someone, or how do you want me to do that? She can go back to her own. Okay, you know where you're going to go then? Mm -hmm. I just right. fell asleep. Oh, sorry to wake you, Zara. That's okay. How are you doing? That's okay. Yeah, sounds like you've been through the winter, kind of having a mess going on, huh? All right, well, uh, I'm here on kind of two folds. I guess kind of try to figure out, you know, like where Alex might be. Yeah. So right now we can't find him. Okay, we can't find your car either. Okay. So that's kind of what I'm here to talk to you about. But first off, I want to know how you're feeling, how you're doing. Not great, <laughs> to no. be honest. Um, I was a little better this morning, and it okay. a little bit. Good. And then I had a meeting with the doctor and stuff, and they're trying to figure out which medications I should be on. Okay. Like that for depression and anxiety and stuff. Before we go any further, let's break down this particular moment. According to Ezra, she had just survived a horrific ordeal, where her ex-lover had, at some point, carved the word boy into her arm. She was covered in such large amounts of blood that the emergency room doctors believed that she'd been stabbed or brutally injured, but she was fine. Her wounds were shallow and superficial, and she was so physically healthy after the attack that the only thing she mentioned the doctor's helping her with is getting her a prescription for her depression and anxiety. Say you went into the emergency room due to a breathing issue. You feel like you can't get enough air into your lungs, and something feels deeply wrong. Their job is to assess you to the fullest of their ability and decipher what is physically wrong with you. They would likely give you an x-ray, run a few tests, and make sure that your lungs and heart are healthy. But if they find that nothing's wrong, they are going to send you away. They aren't going to sit down and talk to you about your anxiety and stress, and then write you a prescription. For that to be the one takeaway that Ezra has from her stay in the hospital is telling. Yeah. Well, that's great that you're meeting with these guys and getting some help and yeah. getting, you the, getting you the stuff that you need, you know, the medication that you need to make you feel better. And right now, things are... I'm trying so hard on my head trying to get things to come in, but they just, it's like, it's just like it keeps getting blocked out and blocked out and blocked out. Okay. And I get really frustrated with this. Yeah, well, just take our time, okay? So I kind of want to walk through yesterday, okay? Um, I've got some of this stuff, but yeah. why don't you tell me about yesterday? what you remember. Yesterday I got up in the morning and I got done looking at, because I've been journaling a lot. Okay. And I got up and I looked at the journals I was journaling and starting to journal. Where are those journals at? My computer, if you guys want it. But, I mean, where, like, where are they located? Google Docs. I know, but where's your My computer? My dad's. Okay, and Stanley? <laughs> yep. Okay. But it's an online thing, so you just need my email. Okay. All right, continue. Sorry about that. And then, so I was journaling and checking my email to see if I have any emails from the place I started working at. Okay. And I had nothing, and I was watching a little bit of TV and stuff, checking on the dog and the cat, and then I showered and got dressed. And then I thought to myself, like, I'm feeling really good today and really confident, like, I should go return some stuff that just kind of makes me feel sad. As a reminder, everyone who came into contact with Ezra that day said her appearance was incredibly off. She was known for being diligent about her appearance, making sure her outfits matched and her makeup was done in a very specific way. But that day, when she went into Racy's, she was disheveled. Her clothes looked thrown on, and her makeup wasn't done, and she seemed agitated to everyone who saw her. So I was like, I'll do that. And I was like, gonna text Jason about it, but I didn't because I thought I would see him at the coffee shop, be like, hey, you're here. But I knew he was busy doing laundry and stuff today, too. So I didn't want to worry him. Not today, but that day. Jason theorized that when Ezra came to Racy's, she had done that to try and run into him after their text-based argument the night before. And this interview shows that he was right. She also had texted Jason that she was going to return some of Alex's things, as we know, and it had led to their dispute. I didn't want to worry him much, so 
I know my dad would be mad about it because he didn't want me driving because I'm currently trying to get insurance. Okay. I was like, I felt like, you know, I could take a step for myself to be confident, you know? Okay. So I went and I made sure all the stuff was in the trunk and the painting because I painted something for Max, a friend. Okay. And so I went to Eau Claire and I went to Racy's and I seen Jason at the coffee shop and I said hi and then I seen Max and I said, Max, I got the painting for you. So me and Max went to my car and then we went to his house quickly to go. He went and got me two paintings and I gave him my painting. Okay. And then we went back to Racy's and Jason was gone and I didn't, I didn't know so I just decided since he's not there I'll just go finish the rest of my day because before f I want to be home before five because I had to watch um, Dane, my okay. dad's, I think it's fiance now. Okay. His son, he's okay. a really good kid. Okay. So I see him when I work at the school. Okay. And I went to town and I was just feeling really good and positive and stuff. Okay. Did you notice anything about the defendant's demeanor during your contact with her that morning? She seemed. Um, in my opinion, understandably sad or maybe uh, low. So you were going back and forth between the dry cleaner and Racy's. Did the defendant eventually show up at Racy's? Yeah, I thought it was off because she wasn't supposed to be driving. Did you notice anything about the defendant's demeanor that caused you concern? She was a little fired up. And I was, I went to town and I went and I got the stuff from the trunk and I waited for Alex to get dressed and like ready for the day so that he could come downstairs and grab his stuff. And then he suggested we talk for a little while and I said, okay, I can talk for a while because your roommate's home, you know, because mm -hmm. then we weren't alone. Cause okay. I think it's been day. Ezra is priming the detective here. The day before, she implied that Alex had hurt her even though she never directly said what happened. But in all of their previous discussions regarding the sexual assault, she never said that she was afraid of him, that he had taken advantage of her, or anything resembling that notion. But now, a month after she broke up with him via text, told him not to contact her again, and he respected her wishes. She is stating that she was too scared to meet up with him in private, even though to be clear, she met up with him in private by going to his house. Alex had never been violent with her, nor were there any examples of Alex being violent in general. Okay. Dave was there, so we talked about kind of like just life and like how I've been feeling and like the situation we went through and stuff mm -hmm. like that. We just kind of talked and he seemed kind of iffy about it, kind of, he seemed pretty upset still that I've been talking to Jason and stuff, but I told him like, this is how I feel and stuff like that. To be clear, Alex was in love with Ezra. Mutual friends of theirs described how heartbroken he was when she called the relationship off, and how after the affair was made public, he told others that he was in love with her. Alex wanted to be with her despite everything that happened, and when she came over to talk to him, he likely thought that they would be rekindling their romance. Okay. And then he wanted to talk some more, because Jason's shown up, and I understand his concern, because he's, of course he's concerned and stuff, and he's just on edge lately too. Mm -hmm. It's like it's been really hard for everybody. Okay. Let's break this down for a second. Jason was not on edge because life was really hard on everybody. Jason was on edge because a month prior, he had found out his girlfriend, whom he loved, had cheated on him with two of his closest friends. Directly after that, that same person had convinced him into thinking that both of those closest friends had sexually assaulted her and manipulated her into cheating on him, despite the fact that all the evidence that was available said that she had willingly participated in the relationships. Not knowing exactly what to believe, Jason went to the police, with the hopes they could sort out what had happened. Still not knowing what to believe, Jason spent the next couple of weeks trying to avoid Ezra, telling her directly to stop contacting him and trying to find some semblance of truth. All the while, she repeatedly shows up where he is, tries to send him portions of her journal, and tries to tell him that she is really the victim in all of this. And right when he begins to trust her again, she tells him that she wants to see the man that had sexually exploited her. Of course he was on edge. And then we were talking, and then Alex suggested we go somewhere to talk, and I said, okay, that seems okay. This is patently false. Jason was the one who recommended they talk in public because he was the one who believed talking privately was dangerous for Ezra. She is also doubling back on what she had said about being afraid to be alone with him, but she doesn't realize that. Okay. So, you know. so, continue. And then after that, 
we were talking stuff and I was like, I really want to go to like a park and stuff. And I just remember I keep saying that. And then after that, it just, my brain just starts to like, so, alright, so you're at his house talking, he's decided to go someplace to talk. Mm -hmm. Where did you end up going? I suggested we go to Owen Park, and I don't know if we actually went there or not. Because I remember going to Owen Park, but I don't know if I actually got to Owen Park or not. That's a scary thing. Because I okay. remember the frog, but I don't know if that's from the other day or from... Okay, what time of day do you think you would have been at Owen Park? Um... I don't know when I was there. I remember leaving the house around, I think it was 10 when I left Your house? the house to my, dad, my dad's house. I think it was 10. Okay. Okay. So, did you guys leave Alex's house shortly after the cops came and checked in on you guys? Yep, because okay. I talked to the officer and said I was feeling fine and stuff, and he said everything seemed fine. Okay. So then you left, and what vehicle did you leave in? It's my car. Okay. And then who was driving? Um, I was driving. Okay. And then Alex was in the passenger seat? Yeah. Okay, and then what happened? Ezra has already stated that she doesn't remember anything more than this, but the officer wants to see if he can coax more out of her. He likely doesn't believe that she cannot remember anything about what had happened, because selective memory loss, like this, without a head injury, is incredibly uncommon, and he needs to find Alex. At this point, they know that the blood she was covered in was not her own, so it's unlikely that Alex is still alive. But if he is, they need to get aid to him as quickly as possible. And then... We were driving, and I was talking about stuff, and he seemed a little upset about some things, and then after that, it just kind of gets funky, like, in my brain. Like, I just start to, It's like there's a blank slate. What were you talking about? Um, I was talking about kind of, like, the, like, counseling and therapy and stuff me and Jason want to pursue and things like that, and, like, how I don't... I don't think I want him to be writing, like, if he does know who's writing my number and stuff on the walls of races, if he could ask them to stop and stuff. Because I know he's, I was like, I understand you're hurt and stuff also in the situation, but I don't think it's appropriate. Just talking about stuff like that. Trying to get things settled between us, you know, because I haven't talked to him since then mm -hmm. I just kind of felt like it felt right for me to, like, express my feelings, but also even though it's like... I also think it's right for the other person in the party to have to be able to express their feelings too, no matter what. All right. So, uh, as you're driving around, this is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, what do you remember next? I remember just Alex started getting pretty upset about some stuff. What was he getting upset about? He was upset because he he was upset because of John and stuff. Because I talked a little bit about, like, okay. you probably get questioned and stuff like that. That's what I told him. Was, like, I'm sure you might get questioned at some point during the case and things. And he seemed upset about it. But he mostly seemed upset about Jason and I because he told me, like, that if I proceeded to talk to Jason, he would be very upset. Detective Proc knows that this cannot be true because he had already spoken to Alex, and Alex had absolutely no issue talking about his relationship with Ezra and what she had said in regards to the John Hansen allegations. Why would Alex get upset at Ezra over the potential that he would have to speak to law enforcement if he already had done so without telling her? While prior to this moment, it's likely he had his own suspicions as to if Ezra was being honest. At this point, he would know that she was actively lying to him. Okay. So then what happened? And then I just kind of remember just trying to explain myself and stuff, and then it just kind of gets, like, fuzzy for me. Okay. And I just feel, like, all I can feel is, like, anxiety and, like, pain okay. and stuff. Okay. Um. It almost feels like, kind of like if somebody would have blindfolded you, kind of feeling. Okay. So then... You get found in Menominee. Mm -hmm. How do you get to Menominee? I don't know. I just kind of felt like I woke up 
and I was scared, so I was just walking down the road. Were, like, what do you remember about that? I mean... I remember being cold. Okay. And that my feet hurt really bad. How about your car? What do you remember about your car, where it was left? I don't remember much about that at all, actually. I oh. just remember being really cold. And just kind of like... It's kind of like the feeling of, like, you don't know what's happening, and you're scared, and you just need to keep walking and walking and running, and I don't know. Kind of like, I felt kind of like a scared animal. I don't know how to describe it. How long do you think you were walking before someone found you? I really don't know. It's very... I keep trying to think about it, and it just, it feels like it just doesn't happen. I can try to think about it, and all I can think, all I can feel is just the feelings, and not, like, seeing. Okay. Do you, so you guys were up, you were located in Manon, and do you have friends, or does Alex have friends in that, in that area? Dunn I County, Al Menominee? I recognize the guy's name. Who? The last name of the gentleman that helped me. I don't remember his face, but I recognize his... I don't remember the last name either, but I remember thinking to myself when I was sitting there that his last name sounded familiar. Was this nighttime or daytime that this all happened? Uh, I think it was daytime. Daytime? Nighttime. I think it was in the afternoon. Afternoon? I hold it in here. I got the report stuff. Just so we can make sure we're... Do you have his name in there? Mm-hmm. Right. So, so about 6 o'clock at night, our officer came down to the oh. ER. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it happened before then? Yes. Okay. I just remember when I was sitting there, just really like scared and confused and stuff and my feet hurt really bad but so, so between the time of let's see you the officers leaving mm -hmm. your place at six o'clock you don't remember where you all went no not really, no i just remember being really scared okay Um, how about your phone? Do you have? Did you have a phone on you? Do you still have the iPod, or did you do you actually have a phone now? I don't have a phone. I just have my iPod. Okay. Was that with you? Yeah. Were you texting or talking to anyone? No. I don't know where it is right now. Okay. Did you have it when you were found by Dunn County? Mm -hmm. They looked in it to try to figure out where I was because I kept. Telling them that I kept saying my old name for some reason. So I know I'm Ezra, but for some reason I kept telling them about Monica Carlin because that was my old name before when I was adopted. Okay. How old were you when you were adopted? I was pretty young. Okay. And then you changed your name to Ezra? Mm -hmm. Or did your adopted parents change it? I changed my name to Ezra about three years ago. Oh, how come? Just felt right. You know, kind of wanted to feel like I had my own identity and stuff. Okay. So, you get picked up by someone, and then what happens? By who? In Menominee. Um, I just remember sitting in a chair at the old man's house. Okay. And then he called the ambulance and stuff. And then they took me to the hospital, and I've been here since then. I had to get exams and stuff done. Into my clothes. Okay. So you have no friends in Menominee or Dunk County, right? No. And does, you don't know about Alex? I don't really know much about him when I think about it. Okay. I told him a lot of stuff about me when I knew him, but I didn't realize that he did Okay. Alex absolutely did tell her things about himself, 
In their texts, he would tell her about his family life, his fears, his dreams. He was an open book. But Ezra didn't commit any of that to memory for some reason, likely because she didn't find value in it. Did Alex have his phone with him while you guys were together? I don't know, maybe. I know that it might be at his house because he uses it as an alarm. Yeah. Did you guys go to someone's house? I don't think so. Did you guys crash a car? I don't think I crashed my car. I mean, if you did, I, I would like to know just so we can go find it. I mean, you're not in trouble. Huh? I don't remember crashing a car at all. Okay. I think I don't really remember crashing a car because I've been in a few accidents. Mm -hmm. And I can't forget those. They really stick with me. In Ezra attempting to play up how sensitive she is, she has ruined her own argument. She's in the hospital after being found covered in blood with the word boy cut into her arm. She's claiming to have gone through something so profoundly traumatizing that her mind is actively blocking the memory so she isn't re-traumatized. And when the officer asks her if she thinks she crashed her car, she says she doesn't think so, but believes she would remember because those kinds of things really stay with her. Her initial response of repeating that she doesn't think that that happened, but can't be sure, was perfect. If she had continued to say that she doesn't know, she can't definitely say, and that she still can't remember, her statements would have been a bit more believable. But having such a firm denial of something while also claiming to have no memory, therefore no ability to confirm or deny anything, is telling. She wants to tell Proc that she absolutely did not crash the car, because she knows she didn't. But even in her attempt to keep her lies consistent, she slips up. Yeah. Were you on anything? I mean, were you on any drugs or alcohol? I haven't drank or done anything since um, back in February before I reported to the police. If you would have done something, what would you have been doing as far as drugs? I can't even think of anything. Uh, marijuana, LSD, cocaine, heroin, meth. Mm -hmm. There's none of that stuff at my dad's house or anything like that. But is that the stuff that you would use, or...? I don't know. If I ever did, I would have only, like, smoked a little bit of marijuana, because there was a friend that I used to smoke marijuana with. Okay. Mushrooms? No. Those are scary. Okay. If there was anything else that I would need to know, what else would I need to know? I mean, how would I have find Alex? I don't know. Did he talk about wanting to harm himself ever? Did he talk about wanting to harm you? Did he? He's in the past talked about harming himself. Okay. Like, what does he say? He usually, he would talk about how that he would get upset because I didn't like, like him fully the way he liked me, and that it made him sad enough to want to hurt himself, and he actually did cut his response, and it really scared me. And so I had Jason help him out because he's a medic. There's no evidence that Alex cut his wrists in response to anything that Ezra had said or done. <laughs> So why did he cut his wrist? I think it was during the time when I told him that I don't really think I could be in a relationship with him. I remember a lot of nights because he goes to the joint to drink a lot. He mm -hmm. drinks every night there. Okay. He drinks quite a bit when he's there every night. And I would get a lot of long text messages that I didn't really understand. And they would just give me anxiety. Okay. So you, if you didn't go to Owen Park, what other park would you have gone to? Um, Phoenix. Okay. Those are the parks I like. And what about, I mean, I, I'm, the part that's baffling me is how you end up in Menominee. I don't know, maybe if I got like pushed out or something because I was covered in a lot of mud. Did you drive into a swamp? Did you drive into a lake? 
Um, I don't... I would have really remembered that. Again, she gives a firm no, then says she would have remembered if she drove into a lake, when no, she wouldn't have. If she's trying to feign as if she has some trauma-related memory loss akin to hysteria, she is actively going against it by trying to clarify that there are certain things she would and would not remember. Did he drive into a swamp or a lake? I don't think so. I mean, it's the part that we're having, like, obviously we can't find yeah. Alex and we can't find your car, so it's a little concerning to us. Yeah. I just remember being really scared and just being in pain. What were you scared of? Being hurt. By who or what? Alex. Okay. By him doing what, though? By him, like, harming me and making me want to do something he wanted. Okay, what do you mean by that? He just, he's been upset, upset at me a couple times when I would go over because I was kind of seeing Alex for a little while because I was very confused. And he would get kind of upset when I was too sensitive or in pain and stuff during those interactions. Who was, Jason was or Alex was? This is the first time that Ezra had ever stated that Alex had ever gotten mad at her and scared her. And this was the kind of thing that Ezra had no issue sharing with other people, as she had on a number of occasions talked to her friends about Jason being rude and making her upset, even going so far as to call Jason verbally abusive because he told her her makeup made her look like a clown. Ezra was not the kind of person who would keep a problem to herself. She told all of her relationship issues with Jason to everyone at Racy's. She then told everyone about how Hanson had allegedly assaulted her after she made the initial accusations, and she told everyone about how her parents were incredibly controlling and belittling towards her. Based solely on this habit, it makes no sense that she would keep this piece of information to herself. Mind you, she had spoken to Detective Proc mere weeks before and hadn't mentioned that Alex had manipulated her into sex, or that she was scared of him or anything of that sort. Instead, she stated that she had a sexual relationship with him while she was in a relationship with Jason. Okay. Did Jason do something to Alex? No. Did anybody do it? Did someone else do something to Alex that he's not around? I don't think so. I wouldn't think someone would, because like, we had not seen each other in a long time. What about Jason? Would Jason do something to Alex? Jason could never do anything to Alex. Jason is just too hot, like, he's not that kind of person. Okay. And I know that Alex and John are really close. Like, really, really close, and that kind of scared me when I found out. Okay. You think Alex could be out at John's house? Maybe. I don't know. I just know that they're close and they how do you, talk about a lot of stuff. How do you know they're close? Because people tell me they're at the bar a lot together and stuff okay. like that. Also because she would actively make the two men she was secretly seeing hang out with each other for some reason. Which is incredibly strange and a bit sinister if you spend any time thinking about it. And a long time ago Alex told me that John and him kind of wanted to start experimenting and stuff like that. Okay. I was just kind of confused about it. Okay. But is there any parks in Menominee that you would go to? I don't know anything in Menominee. How about in Dunn County? I'm not familiar. I'm only familiar with, like, I don't know where that is or what part that is near. Okay. Or anything. I only know, like, places around here and in Stanley and Chippewa and then, like, in Minnesota, like, Stillwater. Did you travel over to Stillwater yesterday? No. I don't. I wouldn't go there because there's not really much there this time of year. Okay. Prior to this firm no, Ezra had been good about saying that she doesn't know, she doesn't think she would, and not giving out rigid yes or no answers, but immediately tells Detective Proc that she didn't go to Minnesota. She also immediately realizes the mistake she's made and says that she wouldn't go there this time of year. How about your car? Does it have like a GPS or anything in it? Anything that helps track it? It's just uh, an old car. How about like a Garmin, you know, those Garmin GPSs that you can type in addresses? 
I don't know, because I think I gave it back to my mom. Okay, but at one time it did, but you don't think it does anymore? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just really fuzzy for me right now, and I want to try to figure it out. The doctor is really bad, because I don't like the feeling of just not knowing what's going on. Again, Ezra knows what's going on, and there is nothing that the doctors can give her to help her figure it out. Anxiety and depression medication doesn't help with memory loss. Yeah, well, you're in a good place. I hope you try to figure that out. Because I would like to know what went on, too. Me, too. Um, and now your car is missing and Alex is missing, and I have no idea if he took it and went someplace, or if you crashed, mm -hmm. or if he dropped you off and left you on the side of the road and took off with your car. I don't know. Yeah. And that's something that we kind of would like to know. Do you know how much gas was in your car? I just filled it up recently. And then I had my wallet and, like, a couple 20s and stuff in there. Did he have his wallet with him, do you know? I don't know. Okay. I just know I had quite a bit of cash in there because I usually try to keep my wallet, like, in my car and stuff. Mm-hmm. Because it's pretty safe in my car. Yeah. You mentioned something about your, all your stuff on Google Docs. Mm-hmm. Hold on one second. So, no parks or anything in Menominee that you would go to? No. Okay, do you think maybe he'd go out to John's house? I just know they're close, but I don't know. Okay. Is there anything else you can think of or anything else we need to talk about right now? No, but as soon as I, like, I want to remember as much as I can as soon as possible. Because yeah. I, it doesn't matter, I just want to know. So, just so I remember correctly. You guys were no arguments going on at the house. You guys mutually got into your car. Mm -hmm. You started to drive someplace, and as soon as you started to drive, you, as you put it, everything goes fuzzy at that point. Yeah. And then you're found a couple hours later wandering around in Menominee, mm -hmm. but you have no idea how you got there. You're covered in mud. Is there a place that you would normally go to get covered in mud? Like... I know because you're an artist and you do that type of, you know, is there a place that you prefer to go for that type of shoots no. or photographs or to that paint? That kind of stuff I usually do in Stanley. Okay. At my parents' house. Okay. I didn't, my clothes are pretty gross yesterday because I felt really bad because I think I like urinated myself and stuff. Okay. When you say, like, how, I don't have any photos, so how covered in mud were you? I know it was just this part of my pants and my, my hands and then not that much. So your legs and hands? Mm hmm. Mm, they had to take pictures and stuff of my disagreement and stuff like that. Okay, who took those photos? The nurse, the same nurse. Okay, why did they take those photos? Do you know? Because there's a lot of, um, there's like abrasions and stuff. Um, my general abrasions. Okay. Stuff like that. Again, there were some scratches, but nothing that indicated that she'd been assaulted. And from the analysis, the injuries appeared self-inflicted. Okay. Um, did Menominee take any photographs of your exterior clothes? No, just the nurses here did, and they took all my clothes, and I got it. Um, so anything else you can think of right now, or anything else where you might be able to think of, hmm, this is where my car is, or this is how my car got there, or anything along those lines? Not right now, but I, I think I really want to talk to them, the, whatever therapist they're going to have come in and stuff to see if they can help me through it. Okay. Um, I will leave my card at the front desk, or have them put in your property. If you think of something, um, give me a call. And I'll come talk to you, or if you think of, hey, this is where the car might be, mm -hmm. give me a call, and uh, we can maybe try to find it that way. Yeah. All right, is there anything else you can think of? Not right now, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Like I said, you know, the big thing is I, I want to find Alex and make sure he's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's probably something you want to do is make sure he's okay. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, if you crash or if you put the car in the ditch, we just need to know you're not in trouble. Yeah, I, but, I wouldn't think I'd be in trouble. But, I mean, if you did that, we just, we just need to know so we can go and make sure he's okay. 
or if it's stolen or something like that. Yeah, I mean... It doesn't have insurance or anything. Correct. But you don't think you put it... You don't remember driving into the ditch or driving off the road? No, I would have remembered that. Because I've been in accidents, and every time that's happened, I can't forget it at all. Okay. But, so you don't remember the time from getting into the car until you're sitting in the old man's house? Mm -hmm. You have no idea what happened in between then? No, I just felt scared. And you have no idea how you got to where you got? No. Just my feet hurt and stuff, and I didn't know why I was, like, I didn't know what's going on. How long do you think you were walking? I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you have any idea what direction you came from or you were walking from? Do you remember turning at all off of anything? No, it was like a straight road. You just remember walking straight? Mm -hmm. Do you remember coming out of a ditch up there? No. Did I you? just remember... I remember my hand hurt because I was... because of the pavement and I fell down. Okay. So I remember falling down and then getting up mm -hmm. and then just walking straight. Yeah. You never came off the side of the road. You never turned off the road. Never climbed out of the ditch. You just went straight. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, I'll leave my card up at the desk for you. If I can think of anything else, um, I'll come back and talk to you. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Um... But do your best to try to think of stuff, okay? The interview gave the detectives no new information to work with, and after searching all the parks in the area, they attempted to retrace Ezra's steps. They started at Don Stipple's farm and worked backwards, and on the side of the road, they found footprints that led down a dirt road with an open gate. Believing the footprints to be Ezra's from the day before, they followed them through the gate and up a hill. In the distance, they were able to make out Ezra's silver car with her drawings on it. It appeared to be stuck in the mud, and there was a body hanging out of the back seat. The officers rushed to the scene and identified the body as being that of Alex Woodworth. It appeared that he had been brutally attacked, and when his body was examined, they found that he had been stabbed 16 times in the head, neck, and groin. The following day, Detective Proc went back to the hospital to talk to Ezra. She'd been moved out of the emergency wing of the hospital and into the Behavioral Health Inpatient Program, and she was claiming that her memory was starting to return. But what she didn't know is that Alex had been found, and that the truth about what she had done was about to be revealed. We will be covering this in our next video. Again, this video has to be done in multiple parts, as I want to make sure that we cover all of the available information, while also making sure I have the ability to upload it on our current internet provider, Slow Internet. As we mentioned in part one, we will be making a playlist for this specific case, and we will be putting these videos in order of first to last. That way, watching it is as easy as possible. We wrote this case as one long video, and hopefully, when I have better internet, we will be able to upload it as one big file. But as of right now, that doesn't seem possible. Our next video will be out soon, and again, I apologize for any annoyance or inconvenience this has caused. If there are any other video topics you would like to see us cover, or a case you simply want more attention brought to, email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. And as always, have a great day and stay safe.